um, this morning, we heard mostly about theory or how we should or could build the Chicago tradition. This afternoon, we will explore practice or how this morning's ideas find their way into the design of actual buildings. Our first speaker this afternoon is Tom Beebe, Chairman Emeritus of HBRA Architects and the 2013 recipient of the Richard H. Driehaus Prize in Architecture. Over 39 years, during many of which he served as the firm's director of design, Tom oversaw design for a wide range of public and private buildings, including the Harold Washington Library Center, the Rice Building at the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Harris Theater, all in Chicago. Tom served as dean of the Illinois Institute of Technology from 1980 to 1985, and of the Yale School of Architecture from 1985 to 1991. His firm's buildings reflect a conviction that the city's public architecture especially should engage its history in a way every Chicagoan can recognize. These buildings are as varied as that history, and for this reason, perhaps, they do not fit is easily into any one stylistic category. Nevertheless, all together, these buildings could only be in Chicago. Today, I hope we'll hear just how this is done. On a personal note, Tom has done yeoman's duty for 19 years as the jury chairman of the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation Awards for Architectural Excellence in Community Design. It's a big job, and I can tell you from firsthand experience that each year, after a long, long day of site visits of up to 10 buildings, no one leaves the jury bus until there's a vote. Please help me welcome Tom Beebe. Thank you, Kim. Um, thank you for asking me to be here. It's um, old history, I guess. Um, what I thought I'd do is go through the process of the of the Harold Washington Library competition. Uh, and as Kim outlined it, uh, we were interested in making it a Chicago building. And uh, we felt that uh, it was important that it would be legible to people in Chicago, uh, not just architects or art historians. And um, we consciously sort of drove the design in that direction. Um, let's see if I can get set up here to start. Um, as you may have gathered from seeing the same slides over and over again, I anticipate that might happen. These are, there was a show, there was an amazing show at the Arts Club at one point where a photographer took parts of the photographs of the, of the Richardson Marshall Field Warehouse store and he blew them up and they became sort of art objects in themselves because there's actually only two photographs, as far as I can tell, of that building that were ever taken. And it became this amazing sort of um, icon of Chicago building. And uh, it was torn down after 45 years. Very few people ever saw it. Uh, there's, ver there's very little photographic record of it. So I, I was gonna, out of this kind of shadowy past, um, I thought I could, would try to reconstruct what I think happened. And what I'm trying to do here is to explain the process that we used uh, in order to try to make this building that was going to be based on Chicago. And I wanted to, I'll explain to you the, the analysis of what we, our analysis of what Chicago architecture was, and then uh, an explanation of what we did. Um, architectural history in Chicago always begins with an apocalyptic disaster of the fire of 1871. This event turned out to be a blessing in disguise for it attracted a highly motivated group of talented professionals to this provincial city in pursuit of both fame and fortune. Following rapid accumulation of vast financial resources, they begin a period of furious construction over the next hundred years. Architects here managed to capitalize on the appearance of innovative technical systems and processes that created the possibility for a new building types and artistic expressions that were varied in nature but adhere to the discipline of carefully considered core beliefs based on the ethos of Chicago. A summer of governing principles that define this architectural competency 
would include the following characteristics. Um, I speak of competency here as in a very kind of basic way. If you're an architect in Chicago and you're building a building, if you're, it's part of a competitive marketplace. You actually have to have mastered the problem at hand in a convincing enough way that someone might hire you. So Chicago in the end is kind of a bottom line place and um, people have, have complained about its lack of theoretical grounding uh, over the years, but in the end it's, it's, it has its own kind of theory which you can sort of uh, glean from this. Let me go back. The buildings must be rational in the sense that they respond to their intended patterns of use in as economical a fashion as possible. This means that the efficient use of materials is required, accompanied by rapid construction in order to cut their costs in the field. The street facades are architectural, whereas the alley elevations are utilitarian. Um, these are drawings of the Marshall Field Warehouse by, by, by Richardson. And you can see here, it's a very kind of basic building. It's a loft building. Uh, it has a grid system that runs through. The outside, it's a bearing wall, which is um, a heavy masonry wall. This is not an innovative structure in any way. It's like uh, many uh, mill and industrial buildings in the United States at the time. It has firewalls that separate into the three sections. Uh, obviously, after the fire, people were a little more careful about uh, spreading fires. The rear elevation, which is uh, rarely seen, I just ran across this drawing fairly recently. You can see there's a courtyard in the back, and the back elevation has uh, increased the amount of glass that occurs in the central area, and which lights the center of the building up and the service areas of the building. So you already have here, there's an in implicit um, demonstration of the street facades were what mattered. The buildings that faced the, the facades that faced the street were heavy stone, rusticated stone. The alley facade, that wrapped around the corner, and the alley fa facade in the middle became a service court, which actually had a glass roof over it, which is quite interesting. And the structure inside is a very small grid. I think it's around 14-foot grid of, uh, of, uh, of a changing structure, which is interesting too. This building is fireproofed up to the third floor, so it has cast iron columns that exist on the lower three levels it switches to um, mill construction, which is heavy timber above that. So you have this kind of hybrid uh, situation of, um, of a structure that's based entirely on economy. Uh, because obviously the, the cast iron is the, for fire protection for the public, it was, it was retail space, and the, uh, the, the construction above that was wood. Um, you can see uh, the interest of Richardson, he's developed this very kind of simple plan with a centered entrance and stair. There's no projecting um, entrance feature at all, and the facades run around the corner uh, in a symmetrical way, which is all very classical. You all then have uh, the columns which don't align with the windows. You'll notice here there's a basic kind of air here uh, that Richardson didn't quite get it, where the, uh, across the, the bottom facade, you can see the columns are aligned with the mullions or the, or the piers. As they go up the side streets, there's no alignment. Because it's a bearing wall, they can bear anywhere. So there, but there's, no, there's none of the kind of mathematical clarity that occurs in, in later Chicago buildings. The inside of the building uh, contains industrialized elements that are embraced for the reasons I described above, and the use of manufactured components requires repetition of both elements as well as procedures producing a regular structure of generalized detail. This is essentially a loft building uh, much of Chicago was built uh, of loft buildings. Uh, office buildings were adapted from loft buildings. You can see the, the structure on the right slide. You can see the uh, columns, which actually have Romanesque capitals to them. And you can see the elaborate loading dock roof, which is industrial parts. You can see also the cast iron uh, beams, uh, which are on a regular modular fashion, which uh, became a kind of standard practice in Chicago. Um, the buildings of, of, the, of, of this time uh, represented a kind of simple ordered formal organizations that are pursued in order to increase legibility. For the understanding of the user is critical to the overall assessment of the building. This public eva evaluation is considered carefully by owners and developers who provide the vast majority of construction in the city. Most of the, most of the construction in the city at this point was not um, public buildings 
it was, it was actually uh, commercial buildings such as this, office buildings, and, um, and uh, department stores. On the left, you see the rookery plan, which has, uh, again, there's misalignment of columns here, so Root at this point hadn't figured that out yet. Uh, you can see the core in the corners where there's not a lot of natural light on the, around the courtyard. The core elements rise there. There's shafts there in the least desirable space. The stair represents the kind of representation of the entrance below, so it's a very kind of simple formal organization. On the right, you see Carson Peary Scott, which has a much more um, developed sense of the frame, where the frame is actually expressed on the outside. Uh, there's uh, the corner entrance, which uh, Gideon found so embarrassing uh, because it wasn't uh, normalized. Uh, it was obviously some kind of mistake for, for, the, for as was explained earlier, the German historical um, uh, tradition. Uh, the, the elevators are backed up against the, in the wall so they'd be out of the way. This is a pure loft space, whereas the, the, uh, the atrium space in the middle of the rookery is to get natural light in. It's, it's a more sort of formal kind of, uh, in, a, in, a, in a classical kind of sense, more formal arrangement. The loft is a very kind of crude form of building. Uh, much of Chicago was built in, in loft format. Um, the buildings are tended to be read plainly by the public. On the left, you can see um, the base of the entrance piece uh, of Carson's, which is by Louis Sullivan. On the right, you can see Marshall Field's store, on the, uh, the, the retail store, the interior, which is quite lavish. So the buildings are meant to be read plainly by the public. Most significant construction is completed for commercial purposes and needs to attract attention through, through its built expression in order to com compete with other buildings of similar intent. Therefore, a constant impulse exists to build ornamental, ornamented structures embedded within the anonymous block structure of the city. So you have this, because everything in the end is, is on similar, exactly the same blocks with the same heights, uh, you had to, through the expression of the, uh, the exterior, you had to somehow differentiate your building from the other buildings. Expression becomes a critical component in the continuing evaluation of architecture in Chicago by the public, with ornament rapidly become a central focus of concern for architects. The introduction of lightweight fireproofing systems like terracotta increased the possibility for highly detailed skins that allowed architects to exhibit their theoretical and artistic skills in order to capture the collective imagination for sh architecture in Chicago is the most public of all arts. Everyone in Chicago has an opinion about architecture from the cab drivers on, and they're actually, their opinion actually mattered to the people who built these buildings. So in the, in the sense, it's extremely pragmatic sort of operation going on here. You're looking for customers, you're looking for people to be impressed by your buildings. Uh, but at the same time, as was explained earlier, you're try, trying to save money through economic construction methods. Um, on this particular display of two, these two photographs is actually from Hilbersheimer's book on Mies van der Rohe. And this, this shows that Hilbersheimer and Mies had, had similar uh, intentions in terms of uh, their structural determinism. Uh, par it's partially true, I suppose. This is, this is actually the most the most um, uh, minimal of Sullivan's buildings. He actually only did this once and then abandoned it. Uh, Mies, uh, as was explained earlier in uh, 860, has the columns with the redundant millions on it, which is actually uh, the result of a kind of um, regular, the, the, the search for a regularization of the ornamental expression. Um, the later work of both Daniel Burnham and Louis Sullivan utilized terracotta as a primary vehicle for architectural expression. While Sullivan pursued an unprecedented democratic expression of unique American ideals in highly styled vegetative ornament, which you can see on the right, um, Burnham focused on a classical ornament based on historical precedent in order to build an urban environment for chaotic American cities. Both systems of expression, while theoretically opposed in principle, relied on modular rep repetitive units that were integrated with the structure of the building in an absolute mathematical way, as were the other prefabricated assemblies incorporated in the building. So on the right, we see the, the Bayard building in New York. 
which was one of Sullivan's last buildings. There's, yes, that really is an angel up there. Um, so, so there's obviously at this point in time, uh, I think Sullivan was uh, under duress to compete with, with uh, the rise of, of classical architecture as, as an expression of commercial buildings. Um, the Bayard has a very kind of sophisticated, I think, expression of structural uh, 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 demands. The modern, the modern critics of the time uh, deplored the, the sort of pseudo-Gothic heads of the windows, but the, but the, the clear uh, uh, development of his ornament from the beginning had this kind of amazing vegetative aspect and uh, uh, incredible kind of plastic quality, which, which Sullivan was a master of. On the, on the left, you see uh, one of Burnham's last uh, uh, facades in Chicago, the, the People's Gas in, on Michigan Avenue across the Art Institute right near here. Um, and you can see here, again, the incredible elaboration of ornament, where ornament was a major determinant in, in what was happening here. This isn't about minimalization in any sense, and uh, it's about uh, expression of cultural ideas and, and, and uh, philosophic ideas uh, uh, through the use of the ornament of the architecture. So this is not an unornamented architecture. It's actually an architecture with ornamental intent. The introduction of the newcomer of genius from another cultural arena occurs with the arrival of Mies van der Rohe in 1939. He examined the built environment and wisely adjusted his more artistic European approach to building design by adopting the architectural competency of the first Chicago school, including the rational, regular, and the formal aspects of his predecessors. Although Hilbert Seimer, though Hilbert, Hilbert Seimer uh, through Hilbersheimer, he believed in an urban strategy that abandoned the classical precepts of Burnham that related to the traditional city of streets and facades, replacing them with object buildings, as was explained earlier today. At IIT, he slowly began evolving a new ornamental approach to architecture that extended the constructional aspects at the expense of the representational. He created an architecture that was more abstract and, I think, less sympathetic to urban context and user needs, he and his disciples incrementally mastered this idiom over a period that lasted o almost 50 years. Um, I think these are incredible buildings in every way. They're, they're certainly master works. Um, my personal assessment of Chicago architecture at the time of the library competition in 1988 was that the Miesian phase of the Chicago School of Architecture had closed Ending with these two urban ma masterpieces, the Federal Center by Mies van der Rohe on the left, that shows the courthouse building, uh, and the Civic Center by Jack Bronson of C.F. Murphy, both managed to balance successfully the block structure of the loop with the desire for freestanding towers, as was explained by Stewart earlier on today. At this time, I felt there was no obvious path for exploration left in order to complete the canon of Mies that had not already been eroded already by its own success. The complete victory of the curtain wall and frame expression over masonry walls had trivialized structural determinism's considerable accomplishment through tawdry commercialization of ever cheaper replication. The thrust of advanced pr practitioners educated by Mies could only imagine that techno technological advancement through longer spans or taller structures would lead to further artistic achievement during the 1970s and the 1980s. As Chicago architecture, as the Chicago public contemplated the loss of its urban heritage through thoughtless demolition of truly significant buildings uh, and witnessed the brutal impact of gigantic speculative structures overwhelming their city, the unqualified support and really interest of, public, of the public for architecture died and was replaced by a suspicion that architecture represented self-serving forces in the city that were neither humane nor ethical. I was drawn to the Chicago literature of the late 19th century. In The Cliff Dwellers by Henry Blake, Blake Fuller, he offers the vision of the loop as a dense acropolis on a vast plain formed by the furious activity of commerce that carves down a gridded landscape of canyons that become deeper each year through ceaseless activity. The walls of the canyon are stone, an ancient mountain range bearing witness to their formation over centuries. These walls are both dark and dense. Another contemporary observer noted the portals of the basements 
usually arched as if crushed beneath the weight of the mountain which they support, looked like dens of a primitive race, continually receiving and pouring forth a stream of people. I wish to recover this lost city of lithic solidity and powerful form that was evaporating into shimmering reflective curtain walls. I wish to return to the origins of the first Chicago school, to an architecture that, that had absorbed the forms of the past in a creative and articulate manner. The work of Soane, Schinkel, and LaBruce particularly interested me. Beginning with the ideas of LaBruce to oppose, who opposing the strict historicism of the French Academy and slavish adherence to the orders, reintroduced arcuated walls and legible forms of ornament that were based on intentional historical precedent from more than one source. This was the progressive side of the French Academy when Richardson was in attendance during the early 1860s and relied on this training throughout his brilliant career. Richardson's design of the facade of the Marshall Field Warehouse Store of 1885, you can see the, the, the building is on the, on the lower street on the, on the center on the left side of the central street running back. Um, that's a representation of Chicago at the time of the building. Uh, this, this design shows a clear uh, relation to Roman aqueducts, which you can see on the right, with their monumental scale and rusticated stonework, such as the one in Segovia, Spain, illustrating the photograph once owned by uh, Richardson. This is actually in the collections of Harvard University. Um, the building also resembles the early Renaissance palazzos in Florence, such as the Palazzo Strozzi of 1489. The use of rusticated stone by Florentine merchant princes attempted to add the authenticity of antiquity to their existence. Both Richardson and Marshall Field independently visited Florence the year preceding the design of the Chicago building. Richardson designed the Ames Monument in 1879 at a remote site in Buford, Idaho, marking the highest elevation of the transcontinental rail line. Built to commemorate Oaks and Oliver Ames, who had been active in the administration of the project, the monument is rust as a rusticated slope pyramid that was quarried on site and re-erected as the powerful man-made man -made object in the landscape. It's kind of an amazing idea to take this natural formation and quarry it and reconstruct it as a geometric object. The potency of the form found in the Ames Monument was not lost on Sullivan, who in 1887 designed the Ryerson tomb in the form of two intersecting pyramidal forms constructed of monolithic, monolithic polished black granite. Finally, at the time I was moved by the final images shown here on the right-hand side, illustrating intense monumental forms which are drawn from the collection of Sir John Soane's house that depicts small Roman cinerary urns to honor one's ancestors. Given a special place in the home, these tiny, highly or ornamental, ornamented objects of reverence display a sculptural power seldom found in actual monumental construction. Um, these are my thoughts at the time of the, of the library competition, and they served as the inspiration for our competition design. Since the work was done by a large group in our office in a short period of time, I felt there was a need for an abandonment of Mucian abstraction for a return to representational architecture based on precedent. I present this redirection here as rules of competency for our team that it needed in order to proceed. Uh, I th you know, we came up with sort of a general understanding of what we we're going to do in order to correct for what we, what, what we thought where the, the, the Chicago architecture, where it had uh, been misdirected. So at this point, um, we, we produced these, these kinds of rules that we followed, which I'll give to you now. Uh, to adjust to the particularist, particularist, particularistic context of the historical site, the building must respect the intentions of the Burnham and Bennett plan uh, of 1909. Um, on the right, you see the view of Chicago looking in from the lake, uh, and on the left, you see the plan, which has been explained already to us once today. You can see the center core area in the plan in darker orange, the radial streets, the central axis of, of Congress. This Congress Boulevard ran right next to the site, and um, that, had, a, that had, uh, had to have some kind of impact on the desi design as it developed. Um, these, uh, I th these two slides, are, I think, are quite revealing. Uh, you can see the main plaza in front of 
the, um, the rather large and <laughs> overly demonstrative uh, city hall, which uh, Burnham designed. He obviously was very interested in getting this commission at one point. Um, as, as was explained earlier, there's, a, there's now an interchange over the top of it. But I was particularly interested in the buildings that sat in front of it because the, although they, they create a square and they have a, a, a large plaza for the city hall, the buildings in front of it on each side, the flanking sort of gate pieces, are also public buildings. And they're engaged in the, in the grid itself. The, the slide at the bottom shows you the city uh, sort of schematic idea of what Burnham was after, which is a kind of generalized height. All the buildings are going to be the same height that are commercial. <coughs> the, they're, they, they filled, they're built out to the property lines, uh, to the sidewalks, and then public space was carved out of that in terms of this plaza in front of the city hall. The two um, public buildings in front are embedded in the grid, partially embedded in the grid, so this seemed to be a kind of precedent of what you could do in our site since this street, when you extend it further towards the lake, became the boundary of the library site. Um, so what, what, um, at this point, uh, we decided that, um, that we'd go back and sort of go back to the origins uh, again and, and check uh, the, let me see what you got here. Well, these actually, what, I, what we're showing here is the, the, um, the idea of, of, of the library as a type. Uh, and we felt that to be legible to the public, the architectural expression of the building will reflect its symbolic importance within the city it will be both monumental and it will look like a library. So this is a kind of sequence that shows uh, the Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve in Paris, which was uh, a sort of model of what what uh, uh, a classical building might be. That Labrousse uh, took great liberties with classicism in this building. Uh, he provided a wall along the outside that had the names of the collection, the authors of the collection inside. He has these arched openings without clear orders, although there are. The, the, the apologists for the development of modern architecture in Europe were interested in the use of his, his pilasters in the upper level, which represented um, buttresses which supported the metal uh, cast iron uh, structure inside it. So it had a kind of endorsement from, from those who are interested in structural determinism as well as those who are interest, interested in, in uh, classicism. It has elements uh, like garlands that occur above the the first floor, which are sort of out of context in terms of most uh, classical architects that are quite effective here, I think. And out of that, you have uh, buildings that are sort of following suit. Shortly thereafter, in this country, you have McKim Mead Meaden White's Boston Public Library on the right. On the left, you had the Chicago Public Library by Rutan uh, Coolidge, and you had this, which is Richardson's successor firm, one of their first classical buildings. And on the right, you have the Newberry Library, uh, which was uh, uh, built about the same time. So there's kind of a, within the memory of the public, uh, these, the last two, these slides are libraries that people would be familiar with and would understand as a, as a library. Um, as in all Chicago buildings, these are actually our, our competition drawings now. As in all Chicago public buildings, the syntax used for planning the library for the person of clarity should follow the principles and methodology of classical design regarding regularity, symmetry, axiality, hierarchy, schema, and formal consistency, but will not exclude typologies familiar in Chicago that are found in commercial structures such as loft buildings and department stores. So what we wanted to do was, you can see uh, the libraries, the center orange building, the, the Congress is passing by in front, we landscaped that. Uh, in a kind of an elaborate way, made sort of a semi-plaza there to make it almost like it's slightly free of the wall of the city. We put extra landscape in a central feature in State Street in front of the library, which is similar to Burnham's treatment of the public buildings that occurred around uh, the, the um, classical city hall. Um, we built out, there was actually the lot, the yellow lot above the orange site was also part of the competition property, and we built that out as a sort of quarter block uh, uh, developer building with a central light court in the center of it. And the idea always was to, by increasing what we were interested in, by we thought by increasing the scale, 
we could get it to read not as a commercial building. That, that was actually explained earlier this morning, too. The, the idea of the city hall in Chicago has an enormous order and an attempt to differentiate it from the commercial blocks that surround it. So you can see on the right the presence of the library on Congress uh, Boulevard, the landscape that occurred there. We actually refaced the end of the Manhattan block and put a, a bridge across in order to create a space uh, off the end of the library. Um, the, this shows you actually the, these are all full block buildings. These were actually pressed in the sense that these are full block buildings. And I, I find this quite striking. On the, on the right you have uh, Holliburton and Roche's uh, City Hall and County Building, uh, which you, the grid sort of runs through, except the middle is broken. It was actually built in two phases, where half it's the city built and half of the county built. They were actually completed at different times. When I first came to Chicago, they had different colored light bulbs in each half. They couldn't even agree, they couldn't agree on how to do this. But it was a fairly unified uh, piece of work. However, there was a bunch of columns that ran down the middle where the alley used to be. However, it, it's, a, it's an amazing sort of uh, study in, in the grid and how you put monumental space in it. So they cleared out crosswalks in the center of the blocks that occur in many large office buildings and department stores in Chicago to get passage through them uh, so people could actually cut through the buildings in inclement weather. Um, it, it's, uh, the, the ceilings are compressed in the, in, the, in the elevator lobbies in the center, so you get a sense, again, of the weight of the building coming down on you. And, uh, but it's all within this very sort of rigid grid system. On the right is Marshall Field's full uh, plan of the full block. The upper left-hand corner was designed first by Charles Atwood, which sort of set the tone for what was going to happen. The ornamentation is slightly different in there. Um, you see the grid running through here, too. And I think it's, it's striking the use of every square foot of this ground floor with counters with merchandise in it and then the, the, the allowance of people to pass through the middle of the space with major walkways, the grouping of the elevators against the walls in order to get them out of the way. So this is actually, there was talk about universal space beginning in, in housing. I, my sense is this, this, this is an interesting study in universal space. You have a grid running through both of these blocks. Um, eventually, Marshall Field connected the two buildings in a more concrete way. The alley in the end didn't go through completely. But you have a sense of, on the one hand, they're, they're utilizing and making an asset out of the, out of the grid in, the, in Marshall Field. By, you, can see a, you can see across it, uh, the staff can see what's going on, uh, the people can see the merchandise. On the right, they close it into corridors, they have closed departments behind it. So this seemed to be kind of two modes you could do if you had a whole block building. One is to provide sort of monumental space within the grid structure, and the other one is to just go with the grid structure and run the circulation through and move all the fixed elements to the edges. Um, the extrinsic uh, ornamental basis, which means the added ornament, um, to, in this case, not, not intrinsic, that would be structurally based. Um, we had, had a sort of rule that all the elements that are, would be gathered would be gathered solely from um, precedent found within the Chicago Loop as well as from li the literary traditions of Chicago. And the iconography would resonate in the memories of the public, was the basic idea. By seeing things that you knew, you could actually uh, could understand how to use them. So the idea of the department store as a typology seemed like a reasonable possibility. And these quarters that run through the ground floor also seemed like a reasonable possibility. This is the rookery on the left with the rusticated stone entrance. On the right is the auditorium building by Louis Sullivan, slightly later. Um, different colored stone, but the base, same basic idea, and clearly indebted to Richardson's uh, Marshall Field store. The upper, the upper floors in brick of the rookery has bands of ornament which sort of tie the building together and uh, give it a kind of coherence, break it down. You also have uh, cornices and, and string courses that run through the auditorium building. It gets more. Uh, rusticated as it comes down, it gets smoother, it goes up. The stone actually changes after the, after the third floor at the auditorium, and it changes the brick uh, at the auditorium. So these are both, uh, as I explained earlier, these are sort of Romanesque-based uh, aesthetic uh, applied to 
an office building, and in the case of the auditorium, it was actually a hotel that wrapped around the outside. In most cases, and the, and the theater space was inside. Um, there are also, uh, we are interested in spaces that are memorable spaces in the loop. On the left is the Rookery in its original um, iteration before Wright actually remodeled it, and it became sort of white and gold at this point. It's very, very sort of uh, medieval in, in the sense of the cast iron uh, metalwork. And on the right is the, the domed space in the library, which uh, we saw earlier too which um, I think people who use the library understood it. There's a famous quote from uh, Saul Bellow that when he first saw this room, he knew that reading was important. Um, so the, the final uh, sort of phase of, our, of our, our rules we developed was that we were interested in not only um, reflecting the um, sort of contextualizing ornament that existed in Chicago, but also we were interested in the ornament as a conveyor of symbolic me uh, meaning. And we thought in order to be profoundly moving to the people of Chicago, design must be ultimately based on intrinsic patterns found in the history of symbolism, reflecting the essential tendencies of the human mind, which are reflected in specific themes and concepts, the stuff of dreams, myths, and fairy tales. So these drawings I did uh, maybe f uh, eight years before this, before the competition, and they had the, the, the sort of life and death of the classical city. It starts out with antiquity with Greece and Rome and a kind of mythological, mythological basis for, for uh, buildings, buildings set in a sacred landscape that was infused with sort of sp spiritual um, uh, qualities. The, it was the same forms were readapted in the Renaissance, taken over by the Catholic Church and the kind of merchant prince, princes in churches and in, in palaces. And so the, although the meaning shifts, the, the forms could be adapted to it. Uh, the third one was for the Georgian city, uh, which eventually arrived in America through places like Boston, where you suddenly had the use of classical forms in, in buildings that were built for, for de by developers for speculation. The, the, you can see the chimney stacks moving in from the outside as the industrialization approaches. Um, and the spiritual life had been reduced to sort of fairy tales and personal demons that exist in the uh, foreground of the garden there. And on the right, you have the sort of the death of the classical city with the debasement of the classical language to commercial, uh, low-level commercial things, uh, the tearing down of residential classical structures and the reintroduction of Mies, of classism in a very abstracted form, uh, which was sort of what the state of Chicago, my sense of where Chicago was at that point. Um, so the next, the next phase, this, this is sort of the rules. So we began to, to sort of lay it out. And, and the plan, I think, show, <coughs> on the left shows you the, the basic arrangement. There's the same uh, sense of the grid, the all-pervasive grid, that runs through the whole building. It's a loft building. And all the specific particular spaces are moved to the outside wall. So instead of like Mises after a generalized exterior, I took all the particularized things and pushed them to the outside because I wanted to have a particularized outside. I wanted to have a wall. And I wanted the inside to be clear like a department store. There's a core in the back which is moved off center. Normally in Miesian uh, buildings, the cores are in the middle with glass surrounding them because they sat as freestanding objects. This is pushed to the back, to the alley side. So if you remember the Richardson plan for, for the Marshall Field Warehouse, uh, this is sort of a take on that. There's a glass curtain wall in the back. The, skin, the, the, the monumental skin comes around the corner. There's a curtain wall that runs along the back. And the serving area, it's, uh, it's actually a service street on the back, which feeds into the loading dock. And there's garages on the back. The elevation on the right, uh, which is aligned with the section, you can see sort of the development of it. There's the base uh, in, the in the section. You can see the base, which has um, the middle floor is the entrance floor. You go down one floor to, to theater and, and performance spaces. You go up one floor to the children's room, which was a separate uh, secured zone. It's like a separate library. And then above the third floor, it switches to to the general collection where you have open stacks. Chicago is always a very democratic uh, place. 
Uh, there were no reserve stacks. Everybody could go and look for books themselves. The staff, to my amazement, was really interested in the idea that you could come into the library and not have to talk to anyone. So that you could, you know, if you're a person, that if you were felt you'd be intimidated by a library, you could go in and you could find the books by yourself and then you could check them out on the ground floor and there was no, there wasn't this stress of, of feeling inferior that this should be a, 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 a kind of experience that would expand you rather than make you feel like you were small. On the top floors, which was glazed, there were monumental spaces on the top. It was originally conceived, the, the Central Winter Garden was conceived as a kind of park. It was actually part of the program. It was perceived as, uh, I perceived it as, as a place where people could go. You'd come up through the monumental spaces at the lower level. You'd go up into the sort of generalized spaces of the collection, get your material. You'd go upstairs and sit in the top, and you could read in this garden. And the garden, uh, interestingly enough, had planters very much like uh, what we were shown early of the Dan Kiley Art Institute um, uh, garden. There was, there was, you could sit up there and you could read a book and, uh, and you had this kind of paradise garden was inside the building. The library, and once they saw the space, became very interested in it as a way to make money. So they decided, they took out all the planters except four and it became a entertainment space which you can rent out for uh, banquets, uh, um, weddings, whatever, and it's a big income stream for the library. So that was sort of a disappointment. There were, there were eating spaces that occurred on the upper ends at each end of the upper level too, which were glazed, which looked south and north. They, they, they tried to get uh, eating venues for the staff on the right and the public on the left, and they couldn't get either of them to work economically. The, the administration is on the, on the uh, 10th floor uh, which overlooks the Winter Garden. So the Winter Garden became a place where you've borrowed light for the staff to overlook uh, this central public space. So that's the basic notion of the exterior. Uh, you can see it's clearly represented as a base, a, a shaft, and a top. Um, there, there, there's a cornice that has a walkway around the outside, and there's a, it's, it's an ornamented building. We decided that we were going to try to ornament it with with ornament which was directly based on the Chicago Loop and then to tie it, try to tie it back to more, more general um, sort of spiritual notions of uh, what the kinds of messages that, archit that ornament could and his had historically been able to, to convey to people in the past. We're interested in having the public being able to read this building as to what it was to use it and sort of be proud of it. Um, so, we go into the photographs of the building itself. Uh, you can see here the Congress Street elevation. Um, this was a historic district. You see on the right the second lighter building, which we just to the right of the library, which was the old Sears store. That uh, is iconic uh, um, landmark building, the Manhattan blocks behind it. There's a whole series of department stores that ran down State Street. They were all in a state of being preserved, and they were landmarked, and all the, the historical um, office buildings going down Dearborn were also landmarked in a state of preservation. So this is a historical district, and we felt we, we could build here in a way which was compatible with these uh, particular buildings, which would always be there. Um, the exterior shows uh, the use of, of the, the uh, rusticated stone at the bottom, there's granite at the bottom. There's a, a band, a guilloche, which runs around the outside which I think we've seen earlier too, which, which, which is like roots ornament, which is trying to try to sort of tie the building together. You have a sense of the energy, the wall coming down, these bands of ornament tie it together. The, the third story, um, uh, the top story of the base has um, sort of residential scale buildings, that, uh, windows that opened into the children's room. And then you have these arcuated uh, walls with have multi-stories of of windows in it uh, not dissimilar from Richardson's building, which we saw in the beginning. There's a cornice, a cornice above that allows you to walk around the building for maintenance. It also, uh, it was, I was trying to keep ice from dropping on the sidewalk, which I think it managed to do a lot of the time. And at the, there's a series of, of ornamental added things which add to the, the, the sort of reading of the building by the public. You can see on the top the, um, there's shields and, and um, 
spears on the top, stylized spears and shields, which you find on, on uh, classical buildings. It goes back to Greece. There were trophies from war, which you mounted on the, you know, your temples to your gods as, as a sort of offering. Uh, there's patterns, uh, which are historical patterns for railings, which are adapted here, panel ornaments based on geometry. It's all based on geometry, which is all based on the modular building. So this is kind of a artistic flowering of the grid, which actually uh, it lies within the building as the structure, and it structures all the secondary elements. The, the, the Windy City figure at the top uh, is a face sort of blowing air out, is a, is a kind of folk notion of Chicago. There's garlands that a, uh, occur between that, which, which give a horizontal emphasis and give you a sense of elevation to the wall. It's not dissimilar from the position of the angels we saw in the, in the, in the Sullivan building, which have this sense that they actually they're holding the building up. So it's not structural determinism, it's sort of anthropomorphism or something. It's, it's attempting to empathize, empathize with, the, with the forces at work in the face of the, of the wall. You can see here again the garlands and the Windy City figures. You can see the owls, their guardian figures on the top, um, uh, which, which are protecting the building from, from, uh, uh, from forces that, aren't, uh, that are hostile to learning, I suppose. Um, <laughs> And you, and you have, uh, we saw those in the, in the little sewn center urns, <clears throat> and, we, and the, there's a sense of this was a monument to Harold Washington, the first uh, African-American mayor of Chicago, the first and only African-American um, mayor by election, and uh, he liked reading, he loved reading. Uh, so this is a kind of memorial to him, too. It always had to be. Uh, memorial to, to him as well as being uh, a, a kind of cultural artifact in the city. We're also interested in the idea of the library as the treasure chest where the knowledge of the city is kept. So all that sort of feeds into this. And uh, these guardian figures at the top are protecting the, the uh, treasure inside. We have the, the all this, uh, all this, because it's, on a modular basis, you get repetition of all the regular pieces. The corners, you have to develop atypical pieces, which happens in ornament, and, and you have to have particularly designs that deal with transitions when you go around corners and things. So all this was like new, new uh, territory for us to kind of figure this all out. It all had to be drawn, it had to be priced, and it had to fit within the budget. So this is the sense of the base when you walk along it, the kind of the roughness of the base. Um, the arched openings, which we recall earlier from the description uh, on the cliff dwellers that shows the weight of the building being uh, re um, resolved through the use of these arched openings. Um, and in, at a closer detail at the bottom, there's uh, Ceres, the, the, the goddess of grain. In our representation, she's at the bottom of these strips. We took the smaller scale windows and ran ornament between them. Uh, in a way to make them into simpler geometric elements on the facade instead of a lot of punched openings. This is a device which you find both in Sullivan and Root, uh, kind of routinely, routinely done. We have uh, a foliated ornament around the entrances and coffers that occur in the thickness of the wall since we had uh, thickness to our walls. Now, just I'm just going to go through this briefly, the way that it's, it's organized inside. This shows you uh, a kind of uh, typical floor, well, this is actually the ground floor. This is actually the entrance where you come in on the left off Congress, the right off the bottom. The auditorium is coming up through the, through the floor there as a void, and you have service spaces in the back. So you can see this clear public space uh, and service space in the back. In the entrance lobby, these corridors, much like the City Hall County building, uh, converged on the center uh, lobby. The lobby had a hole in the base which looked down into uh, uh, the lobby for the, for the assembly spaces below. There's a history of the civil rights movement in, Ch in, the, in the United States, which is done on the, on the floor in, in Terrazzo by an interdisciplinary team of artists and architects. This shows the plan on the right 
of how the lower level worked. Uh, when you look up from the lower level, you can see the ceiling above. The coffering uh, is uh, classical, neoclassical in its, its origin. The, the exact ornament of the coffers are from, from, and that's actually Greek, it's from the Propylaean ceiling, and when you come onto the Acropolis in Athens, and you can see the, uh, get a sense of the ornamentation that occurs in the auditorium in the basement. When you go up to the, to the, um, the second floor, there was supposed to be a, a connection to the L on the second floor on the right, which was never built. Uh, the city decided not to do that. Um, we have the children's room on the left, and then you have service elements that occur on the top of the plan, and you get a sense of the, the, the children's room which was designed with smaller than furniture and all those things. There's also 1% for art in here that, that was used to, to kind of adorn the, uh, the children's area. The escalators, we decided to use escalators to get around because uh, I felt that the, the department stores were some, something that people understood and they understood how to use escalators. So this is looking down to the main entrance. You come in and you go back up on the escalators uh, to arrive on the, on the uh, third floor. The third floor is where all the checkout desks are. And th at this point, the circulation changes from the front to the back. So every time there's a change in section, uh, or which, which indicates a change in function, the circulation system uh, changes also. Um, this shows you the catalog areas that occur on that floor, where indices are there, the checkout's there, uh, the newspaper's there. This is a general sort of gathering space. You move up um, to a typical floor, we're back to the plan of the typical floor. There's reading rooms across the lower wall. There's two-story um, uh, uh, group study rooms, and there's single-story uh, study rooms with Carol. So this is an attempt to have the kind of amenity of, of a kind of university library uh, where you have different kinds of reading rooms for various kinds of study. And you can see a typical arrangement of the, the cross axial um, circulation. The escalators are now in the middle of the building where they move through the center section. Uh, and you have circulation along the outside wall that allows access to the reading rooms and also is sort of a self-policing thing. There's a lot of concern by the library about uh, crime in the reading rooms, which uh, by moving the circulation to a position where people are always going by there, there doesn't seem to have been ever, ever, any kind of problem there. The stairs are on the ends, again, to, to fill out the kind of poche of the outside walls. The technical systems follow the same kind of notions. There's an underfloor duct system that feeds electronic devices. It's heavier at the back where the technical areas are. On the right, you can see the red areas where, are where the technical spaces are. The stacks are towards the south, towards the reading rooms. And each floor is different, so the configuration is entirely modular flexible system like a Mesian building. You can reconfigure it actually after we won the competition. We had to reconfigure it all completely uh, because they changed their mind the process of, of the th between the time the program was written and uh, the time to build the building. So we, we designed it once for the competition, we designed it again on the same system, reconfigured all the floors, and it was actually no problem. Um, you can see the service desks occur in the gray areas in the middle there. They actually are facing the elevators where, they, where they, people moving through the building can talk to the staff, the staff can see them, and you see uh, kind of a special room in the middle of all that, which has um, the little cross-shaped room, it's actually Chicago author's room, so you could actually introduce figural elements in there for symbolic space that occur within it, but you can see the general pattern of how the floor is laid out. Um, the, the, the Chicago author's uh, room was on the left. We had reading within the stacks, which was, we want to have a variety of reading kind of spaces. That was next to the escalators. There are reading rooms that was actually old tables from the existing, the first library were reused in this building. And the escalators came down in front of the, of the service desks, as you can see on the right. This is looking down that corridor into the, into the study areas, the study carrels, the smaller study areas and some of the larger ones on the right. Um, this again is now up the top. We now arrive at the top in the attic story, at the sort of above the, the cornice. And this is the central winter garden looking um, actually to the east. 
And then you can see that the windows of the, of the, um, of the staff areas, which borrow light from this space, but also gives a kind of built-in uh, surveillance of it, which seems to have worked perfectly well. Um, finally, I don't know how much time do I have? One minute, OK. Um, should I do this or not? I, I have a whole picture of, of trying to figure out how to fabricate ornament. I can do this rapidly. These are railings which are uh, laser cut. Uh, these are built up aluminum railings which were then uh, painted. And this is the, the, the garland, the, uh, the interwoven garland on the top of the, of the roof. This shows you the, the guilloche and how those pieces were. That shows you how we bid it. It, was, uh, it had to go out and be bid. It was built, sort of bid all over the world by people. And uh, a guy in Holland actually won it. And you had to do plaster pieces for the, for the built up things. And then they had to be made into molds that go into concrete. These are the cut granite uh, columns at the base, which were the corners were, were cut off to give you a very sort of um, abbreviated uh, capital and base. Uh, this is the curved, curved uh, uh, with the new machinery for, for cutting with laser cutting stone. You can actually do curved things quite easily. Um, these are modeling for the, for the, for the large figures now uh, on the outside. It's always amazing how big these are. You, you don't register from the street how big these are. This is, um, this is a series, uh, the series figure, which is hand molded, and it's made into molding. That's Ray Kasky, the guy who's in charge of this, and one of his assistants on the right. These are the garlands. Shows you the attachment of the, of the ornament to the, to the wall that was behind the, the well, there's a block wall that ran behind that. Um, this is uh, Kent uh, Bloomer's backyard. We built a three inch, we built a three inch equals a foot model, and we uh, changed it and redid it a hundred times. Um, this shows you the, which I think Kent did an amazing, these are, these are the, the acroteria, the leaves were, were, were sliced, um, and then they were overlapped, so you got these amazing sort of pattern, tracery patterns that came through it. This is Ray Kasky working on the owls in the corner, the other owl, the big owl in the middle, which is cast aluminum. And this is the final product. So you have the ghost-like Richardson Marshall Field store on the left, the library on the right, and uh, an experiment to try to make um, continuity between the past and the present. So that's, the, that's my story.